Max Gawler, Melbourne Football Club. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. This is Nat Fife from the Fremantle Footy Club. Trent Cochin from the Richmond Footy Club. Scott Benderbury from the Collingwood Football Club. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. Patrick Cooch from the Carlton Footy Club. It's Rory Sloan here from the Adelaide Crows. This is Tom Mitchell. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. When we got to the end of the 2023 fantasy footy season, all hardcore coaches got out their notes on their phone, or if they're really old, a little black book, and started to write down a couple of names that they knew they'd really want to own in the 2024 season. One of the first names written down was no doubt Sam Walsh. His season, in contrast to his history, meant we were looking at a potentially juicy matchup that was going to be at an incredible price point for us. And then the AFL throw in opening round and an early buy, and it's thrown everything up for us in 2024. But is Sam Walsh the best value prospect of the season, or is he just a nice pick in 2024? He's number three in my 50 most relevant it's MJ from the Coaches Panel. I hope you all, can you believe it? Just three episodes left to go in this series. And Sam Walsh, a fascinating player to talk about. And joining me on this episode, if you play AFL Fantasy, there's a chance that you're very familiar with the team at Hat Chat, making his Coaches ta- Panel debut and on the 50 Most Relevant. It's DC from Hat Chat. Mate, nice to see it. Thanks for jumping on this episode. And boy, Sam Walsh could define a lot of seasons if he returns back to what he's done previously. Hi, MJ. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolute absolute pleasure to be here. I feel a little bit of pressure coming in for number three on the list. But um, yeah, Sam Walsh is a really interesting pick. I'm obviously going to speak mainly from the AFL fantasy point of view, but very highly owned at the moment. Uh, We know he's a gun player. I think everyone would would say that at some point he's probably going to be close to winning a brand low in his career. He seems like that sort of quality of player. Um, I've got maybe a few question marks about how that translates to AFL fantasy. Uh, I'll leave the super coach to you, but yeah, definitely underpriced. I think that's the bottom line. As you said, he had a, a pretty interrupted year last year, injured for a lot of the preseason and then had a, a stint out in the middle of the year as well. Um, and comes in priced at under a hundred in AFL fantasy and, and DT, which suggests there's a bit of upside there. I just question how much. That's the big question. We know he's more than likely, barring another injury setback, outperforming what we're going to pay for him. The question is, as DC's mentioned, how much growth and will it be worth it? If we look at this 2023 season, just with a kind of a glass ceiling overview, he comes in a seasonal average of a 103.2 in Supercoach, means he's priced at just over 570,000. Nine tons last year in that format. A 134 is the season high score, but a 193, a career high score. So no doubts about it. Sam Walsh can absolutely ball out for us in Supercoach. Well, in AFL Fantasy, as DC's already mentioned, 94.6 average six tons last year which means in the formats of afl fantasy and dream team he's going to be priced at just over 850k in fantasy a touch over 870,000 in dream team and a top score last year of 144 he's just a little bit skinny of his season of really his career high school of a 155 Often during the 50 most relevant, we talk about if a player doesn't have consistency in their body, it's really hard for them to be able to live up to their best. And DC, you already mentioned that back injury that required surgery in the 2022 to 2023 off season, then has a hamstring injury when it felt like he was really just starting to get going in that match against West Coast where he was basically at a super coach ton early in the second quarter and was looking like knocking out a 150 plus in AFL fantasy. But my goodness me, we forget just how good of a player he is because he's had been so stop start, just an incredible endurance athlete gets in and under and wins the contested footy, which is great for super coach spreads and links up for this Carlton midfield that really is rejuvenated and developed nicely over the past couple of years. And under their new coach in Michael Voss, he's just that perfect midfielder, isn't he? He's he's not elite at any one thing outside of his endurance, but my goodness me, mate, he's a very, very, very good footballer and complements this Carlton midfield nicely. Yeah, absolutely he does. And he feels like he's been that since he's come into the AFL. Like he was basically a premium from his first season, which not many players can do. 
had a lot of pressure being a number one draft pick and, and has lived up to that, I would argue. There's always been that debate about who is the best player in that very good draft, but I think he's, he's clearly in the conversation there. Um, probably has stalled a little bit over the last couple of seasons from where he was in 2021, where he averaged 109 in AFL Fantasy, which is his career high, I believe. Um, but yeah, on his day, he's still as good as any midfielder and potentially as damaging as any midfielder in the AFL. So 94.6 last year in AFL Fanny, that's six tons, three over 120. So he did still have some ceiling about him and just the three basement scores under 80. One of them was that injury impacted game that I alluded to against the West Coast Eagles. Well, over in Supercoach, that 103 average, nine tons. 130 was his only 120 plus score of the year, but he did just have the one score under 80. I think, DC, we've kind of got to look at Walsh's season in three parts, and we'll turn to 2024 in a moment. But it really, depending on which of the thirds you believe, probably tells you whether or not you're extra bullish on him, you're interested, or you're ice cold. In his first seven games of last year, goes at 113.5 in AFL Fantasy and a 110 in Supercoach. That that certainly echoes what we'd seen from him in the two seasons prior, where he goes 103 and 109 in AFL Fantasy and 110 and 117 in Supercoach. So we're really seeing an echo there. The next eight games, it does include an injury-impacted game but a 78 in AFL fantasy and a 97 in super coach. So well below what he's even priced at. And then the three AFL finals matchups. Well, he goes a 111, 134, 121 in super coach, averaging 122 and a 101, 140 and a 105 averaging 115 in AFL fantasy. It kind of sums up Sam's year really, doesn't it? Just those three segments, doesn't it? DC, he's either super hot, Super cold, super hot. And that's why he presents value for us this year. Yeah. I mean, depending on which side of the fence you sit on, he either present, prevents value or you're steering clear. So uh, he's not the only player that had that had that last season as well. I think of someone like a Tim Taranto that had a really obvious split in the season as well. Jack McRae, also another popular player for us. It's, it's a little bit unusual in some ways to see such a clear differentiation between one part of the season and another. But um, as you said, at his best, he can match it with the best midfielders in the comp. We just want to know whether he's going to be able to do that for a full season. Uh, did he overperform in some of those games? Did he underperform in, in some of those games? It's really difficult to tell. I don't believe there was a huge role shift there. He certainly spent a bit of time starting off the half forward line in AFL Fantasy, but then pushing into stoppage. Um So, yeah, a question there whether that's going to continue this year and what that means through scoring, but he showed that he can score in pretty much any role. Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my 100th Mint commercial. No, 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 no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I'd only have to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. This Carlton midfield fascinates me. It, it, it's very different to what it was in 2022 where Adam Cherry was just finding his feet and George Hilt was finding his feet. And politely, Patrick Cripps was absolutely doing Patrick Cripps-style things. Then 2023, it's evolved a little bit. Walsh missing for big chunk of the preseason and season proper. As you mentioned, playing this high half forward role, pushing up into the midfield, arguably scored at his best when he played that in that AFL home and away season anyway. Now, as we look to 2024, what's your read on this Carlton midfield? Because we can't just go in 2021 and 2022, Walsh did X because Cripps was a different player than he was over the past two seasons. Hewitt, has rounded out the defensive mindset of this team beautifully. Chera is now settled and a part of it. And they've even thrown a Sam Doherty into the mix due to some dynamic change off the inside and the outside. So what's your take on this Carlton midfield? I know some are like, it doesn't matter, but I really believe that how this midfield lines up does intrinsically link to what level of scoring output we might see. Yeah, absolutely. I think that should be one of the first things you're assessing for any midfielder you want to pick 
in a, in a fantasy game is, is who else is there to take points off them? Where are they going to sit in the pecking order? And as you rightly point out, in, in 2021, where Walsh scored his, his career high, they didn't have Chera at the club. They didn't have Hewitt at the club. Uh, Paddy Cripps averaged in the low 80s. The highest averaging midfielder outside of that was Ed Kerno with an 89 average. Ooh, yeah. um, Ooh, Kennedy just... only played a handful of games. Doherty was playing half back. So there's way less names there that season. He was the number one guy, probably him and Cripps. But from a fantasy perspective, he was well clear of everyone else. Whereas last season, you know, we saw Chera average in around the same amount as as, as Walsh. Uh, Cripps, from a, a scoring perspective, was a little bit lower than the previous season, obviously, when he won the Brownlow, but still in there a lot. Um, Hewitt had a bit of a stop-start season as well, but we know the season prior he had a very good year. Um, Kennedy has shown in patches that he can be a dominant inside mid as well. So, And, and then we saw, saw Doherty play a little bit of time inside it in patches. So there's a lot of players there for him to compete with. They've also brought across Elijah Hollands this year as well. Let's talk that Ollie Hollands could spend a little bit more time inside. So there's a lot of players that um, will be gunning for those inside midfield spots. And the, the reason why I think that is a bit of a concern is because Walsh has shown that he's able to play slightly different roles. He's shown he can play on the wing. He's shown, as we just spoke about, that he can play off half forward and push into the stoppage, which I think is probably the better of those two options, funnily enough. Um, but yeah, there's a few question marks there for me and and, and just whether whether he is in those top two or three midfielders because of his versatility. Is he the best contested ball and clearance player at Carlton? I'd say no. I'd say that's still Patrick Cripps. A fit Cripps and a healthy Cripps is still one of the best in the league, let alone in his team. Is he the best defensive-minded player in this Carlton midfield? I'd say no. That's George Hewitt. That's why they've brought him into this side for him to be able to fill out the gaps and the deficiencies that had previously been there. Is he the classiest and best user of the ball by hand and by foot in this midfield? No, I'd say it's Adam Chera. He's so silky smooth. If there's a choice on the left or the right um, as that first touch player, who's the first receive option? If you've got a choice, you're going to get it in the hands of Adam Chera. What's Walsh? He's the best rounded player they have and probably alongside of Oliver Hollands has the best tank at this club. And so there's still a way where he can score through transition points incredibly well. Just go back and listen a few days ago to the episode I did with Jade um, on Jackson McRae. And we talk about players that are in the midfield. We want to see a nice split of scoring from stoppage and scoring from transition. And that's certainly what we're looking for with a Sam Walsh is if we're just hoping he gets all these points at clearance, you're going to be slightly disappointed because Hewitt will get a share. Chera will get a share and Cripps will take the lion's share. If you're waiting for him only in transition, they're going to look for those Hollands boys on the edges. Saad, Newman, Doherty is an in and outsider. So for me, there's certainly enough to be a little concerned, not about his scoring abilities, but his scoring ceiling, which is what we do need for him to lift from where he is. Because so much, I know it sounds silly to say, DC, but so much of his scoring is linked to possessions. Like, he, he, he's not a huge tackler, it's not huge on the mark sides of things. He, he gets involved, let's not get it wrong. But he really needs to average nearing 30, if not more than 30 possessions a game to now return value for us based on what we're paying for it. Yeah, definitely. Even last season, he averaged 28.6 disposals a game, which is actually 12th in the AFL. We'd probably consider they had a bit of a down year. Uh, in 2022, he averaged 32.1 which was only behind Oliver and Laird. Um, and, and he was significantly lower in terms of averages than those two that year. So it's it says to me that he probably has some room for improvement from a scoring perspective, at least, in his tackling and marks. He actually averaged the most tackles per game of his career last year with 4.8, but his marks dropped from 4.5 in 2022 to 3.5 which is a fair bit lower than what we would expect from a player like him who we probably t term still a primarily an outside mid who can go inside. But outside and, and gathering up uncontested possessions is really his strength, as you said. His, his running ability is fantastic. So that then leads me to think, is that a, a 
uh, an issue with Walsh's game style. It was an issue with the Carlton game style. And I think we saw quite an obvious shift in how they were trying to move the ball, particularly in the second half of the year and, and being a lot more direct, chipping the ball around a little less and certainly less than what they did with him a couple of years ago. So that that would be a, a slight flag for me is, uh, are they going to move the ball a bit quicker, maybe a little bit more similar to, say, a team like Port Adelaide, who we know didn't score many points last year, but moved the, the ball uh, quickly and were very damaging. Um so, yeah, a, a few concerns there about whether he can get the tackle numbers high enough and the mark numbers high enough to really supplement the, the possessions and push his average into sort of top eight mid territory. It was in the final two months of the year that Carlton really got going. That's when this game style that DC is talking about, where the speed of movement on the ball got moving and guys like Newman and Saad were always dashing and booting the ball out of D50 and getting heavy rebounds. But it comes as no surprise to me that it's in that stretch of time where Walsh averaged 78 in AFL Fantasy and 97 in Supercoach. But, but MJ, he, he went 120 in Supercoach and 115 in the finals. Yeah. What do we know about finals footy? They are hotly contested games. Opposition teams shrink the ground as desperately as they can. They give no one even an inch or a mile. It's different styles of football. And so no surprise, Walsh's numbers increase back up a little bit more. We've kind of talked around at DC. We've kind of talked about Walsh as if there's no big hairy monster that happens to appear (laughs) early in the season. But we really do need to address it. He... And the rest of his Carlton teammates are one of a number of teams that play an opening round. Great. We get to have a look at these players. Fantastic. We get to see the roles. Fantastic. We'll even get a bump on their price movement. We'll get that doubled up for us in AFL Fantasy and a little bit early in Supercoach and Dream Team than not what we normally would. Fantastic. This still sounds great. However... If you play opening round and you're just catching up on your fantasy footy news for 2024, your team is having a buy either in round two, round three, round five, or round six. None are good. One is horrible. Round two is the worst to have had. And that's what Sam Walsh has got. It's not a good spot to be. Does that immediately rule him out? I know we've talked a lot about players and early buys and things, but To you, DC, is it just as simple as you're in that buy? It almost doesn't matter what you are, mid-price of value or premium. Are you just ruled out in general? Or is it a little bit different depending on your price point? I think it's different depending on on your price point. We obviously have uh, spoken a lot this preseason across the various podcasts and platforms around Zach Williams, one of his teammates who comes in very cheaply priced uh, because of his injury last year. I think he's quite a different case, for example, to Sam Walsh. He's about half the price in most of the formats. Um, And you're really picking him to generate cash early in the season and then to be able to move him on to a a premium at some point. If you're picking Sam Walsh price in the mid-90s in AFL Fantasy fantasy and a bit over it in a bit over 100 in Supercoach, you're picking him there to really be a keeper for the season for you, Um, which means that he is effectively there to score you points. He's not there to make you money. He's He may be a little bit underpriced, but you are, are wanting him to average over 100 in those formats pretty comfortably, I would say. When you then add in that round where his, his position on the field is going to have to be replaced by a rookie, you're looking at maybe copping a 50, 60, 70 type score that week. And if you're picking a, a guy that you want to average over 100, that's a fair whack of points that you're going to cop that week that you need to deal with. The other issue on top of it as well is are there other player, players around the same price point who don't have those buys? And I think in the midfield there is. A bunch of them we've already covered through the 50 most relevant. An LDU in AFL Fantasy. A uh, uh, Zach Butters is not too far away from it in AFL Fantasy. You've got a steal in a super coach, for example, who's got an arguably a better pedigree of scoring history at a cheaper price point, okay, and none of these early buyers. So it's there. What's your take on trading into Walsh then at round three? You get two games of data, you get opening round and round one. 
Is that the better approach for you? We'll talk about ownership and expectations in a moment before we wrap up the episode. But is that the approach for you about Sam Walsh, that it's a watch, wait, see, observe, and go? Is that the way to play Sam Walsh this year? I think so. I think specifically with that round two buy, you're only getting two price rises there uh, prior to the buy occurring. So it's unlikely he's going to get away from you from a price point point of view. Um, so unless he comes out and drops two 150s on the bounce and goes up a 100,000 in AF, you're probably still comfortable enough getting him, even if he goes up 40, 50K. It's not the end of the world, particularly at that, that stage of the year, if you think you've seen enough and you think he's still value after the buy. Um, but yeah, we don't, as we've spoken through, we don't really know how that, that midfield structure is going to look for Carlton when everyone is fit, who's going to play on the inside, who's going to play on the outside. So I'd be taking those couple of games, having a look. And then if you're still really, really keen, you can get on him after that, that round two buy. In Supercoach and Dream Team, his price isn't moving before that buy. You get the opening round and round one. And so literally he can become, if you need it and you see enough that you like, does an injury happen in this Carlton midfield? So he has to take greater responsibility or as DC's articulated for us. No, we see him using his high athleticism, his high endurance capacities to link up and to get to points through stoppage, to get to points through transition. And now all of a sudden with a strong Carlton side, he's able to impact and support the scoreboard impact for this team well now here's an incredible pathway moving forward for you i've heard some in the community go oh i'll take the early price bump in afl fantasy where i get the two price movements and i'll flip him at round two politely you are gonna have a spot fire somewhere in your team and that spot fire might not be you did something wrong that spot fire is a guy that is just burning white hot that you have to go and get. Last year, it was the Will Day. It was the Will Setterfield or a Nick Dacos if you didn't own him. These are the styles of plays you don't want to rule yourself out of getting because you've already telegraphed a forced trade by putting someone there. So I, I agree. I think that's the right approach. However, I've got a quick question. Deciding which credit card or loan is right for you is like trying to choose where you want to eat for dinner. Except when you finally get to the restaurant, the menu is riddled with jargon that no average foodie could understand. So at Credit Karma, we keep things simple. We show you personalized recommendations that align with your money goals and help you turn the confusing fine print into terms you can actually understand. And as a cherry on top, we provide a detailed overview for a new card or loan before you apply. That way, we can help you make decisions faster and with more confidence. Download Intuit Credit Karma today to get started question for you when a player misses in round two or three or five or six it does open up the ability for us to maximize our vice captaincy scoring we rarely outside of an r3 position throw that spot away for a red dot or a blue dot we're trying to maximize as many points on field as we can and as much cash generation as we can with our off-field rookies is having someone like a sam walsh with the VC in mind for round two, does that tip the balance in your favor to go, you know what? He gives me a good round one. I get a look and see an opening round so I can commit to him there. I get myself a vice captaincy option. And now I'm away with someone I think is the value buy of the year in many people's minds. Is that enough to kind of break the deadlock for you? Or is it still way too much? No, nah, round three and beyond. Yeah, I think at, at his price point, it's still round three and beyond for me. I think that blue dot strategy is a viable one, but I wouldn't be doing it with a premium. And, and if that's the main reason you're picking them, I, I think that's the wrong thought process. So I think someone like a Zach Williams, where he's actually not that much more expensive than a rookie, maybe that is the better way to go there. You can carry him through that buy. You can replace him with a rookie. Probably not going to cost you a huge amount of points. Uh, you still have the VC loophole there. But yeah, for a Sam Walsh, it's just too much to be to be picking him for that reason. So if you haven't picked it up, it it's rare that you get me and whoever's on the other end of these podcasts, whether they're part of the coaches panel or a part of the AFL fantasy and super coach community, both cool on a player in our starting squads. But MJ, why is he at number three if you're so freaking cold on him? Excellent question. Here's two reasons why. One, just because you choose to not start with a player doesn't mean they're not relevant. 
The pathway to bring him in and get the output you expect is absolutely viable. DC's done such a great job for us on this episode of breaking down the early concerns, but not so much around his scoring potential, but rather getting as many data points and eliminating risk as you possibly can through that round two buy, through watching what happens in a further game of data in round one, not just opening round, and then making an informed decision from round three and onwards. The number 49 player we had in this series was Callum Mills. People are like, why are you putting a guy that's injured that's not going to play three quarters or half of a season? Simple, because during the season, you're going to want to make some upgrades and get some value, and Callum Mills presents it. So let's not assume relevance only is isolated to starting squad selections. But if you're starting him, you, and you're one of the 24% in AFL Fantasy, 31% in Dream Team, and 32% in Super Coach. What are you doing at round two? And what are you doing to protect that pick? Because you can do it. You can be bullish. You can get lucky with a cash cow that pops an 80. You can get a ceiling game with one of your vice captain options, and you're away. But you can't just put your head in the sand and hope it's going to work for you. So, can you start Sam Walsh? Yes. Of course you can. It's just got to be protected across every other 29 selections that you make, and it will change the makeup of your side. But if you're starting him, it means you're bullish in AFL Fantasy. He's giving you a minimum 105 and pushing back to that 110. In Supercoach, he is giving you a minimum 110 and pushing that 115. If you don't think he can get anywhere near that, DC then he absolutely isn't someone you can lock into your starting squad and is then only an upgrade consideration. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I would agree with those those averages that you probably want him to get to. I've probably got him pitched somewhere between 100 and 105. I know a lot of people have said he's, that, he's a 110, but he's never actually done it in AFL Fantasy. And I think he's got more working against him this year than what he did a couple of years ago. Um, as I said earlier, still clearly has value could be a very good starting pick. But as you quite rightly point out, you need to have a contingency plan for that round too. Maybe that's rolling with an extra higher price rookie on the bench that you think can cover him for that round. Could be viable. Maybe you're thinking about the fact that he's going to spend a lot of time playing off half forward and you're picking him to switch him into the forward line at some point because you think he's going to get forward status. I think both of those are, are quite risky, so I wouldn't be necessarily advocating for that. But there is some lateral thinking you could use here to to convince yourself to start with him. It's just not for me at this stage. Yeah, I'm with you. But he's relevant. He's undoubtedly relevant. The high ownership across the formats, the high anticipation and expectation as maybe as inflated as I think it might be, it's still relevant. So is he important for our starting squads? He's worth a think. But have you thought through all the cascading implications? And if you haven't, Good news is you've still got a couple of weeks to do that. If you have and you're still bullish on him, fantastic. As long as you know the narrative and you can articulate your why behind it and it holds water, I'm pretty happy for you to go ahead and do that. Draft is a different story though, DC. Uh, where does he go on draft day again? We know salary cap hype does inform the draft community of noise. Uh, we also know previous season's average does inform our ADP selections as well. In an AFL fantasy draft, I'll ask in that format, where do you see him going on draft day? Yeah, I think he's probably in that M2 range. So I think from memory last year, we had eight players average over 110 in AFL fantasy. Uh, if we're talking about the fact that we're not sure whether he can get to that, I think he's pretty clearly not an M1. I'd probably have him at the back end of that M2 range. So anywhere between 15 and or the 15th and 20th ranked midfielder is about where I'd have him. He could be higher. He could surprise us and slip lower. Um, but yeah, I think that's a fairly safe spot to take him. Yeah. If he's your M1, it means you're probably one of two things. Gone over bullish on him 
or you have really drafted in your first few selections in positions outside. You've gone and picked up that forward, that ruck, that um, defender, and then maybe at your third pick, you're coming round. If that's the case, I'd take some medicine and say it's perfectly fine. But outside of that, he's an M2, might even slide us some M3s. I think that's a really astute call, mate, that we could see him drift there. And in super coach, I think he's more likely to have an ADP as the M3. I don't see him inside that top 20 midfielders that people will draft. But again, all it takes on draft day is one bullish coach, one Carlton supporter, someone to really want to own that player and your ADP and your rankings go out the window. The good news for you is then probably someone you've got higher is available to you lower. So it's going to cascade out all in the end a little bit better for you. Mate, it's been an absolute privilege talking to you. I've long been a fan of what you and the boys at Hat Chat have been doing. DC, where can we find you across social media and how can we tune in to what you guys have been doing across the preseason and will do through the season proper? Yeah, thanks for having me on, MJ. Great to chat. Uh, yeah, you can find me at DC Caterpillars on X or Twitter as it used to be known. And you can find Hat Chat at Hat Chat AFL on all the socials. Uh, we're back releasing weekly podcasts as well, so they usually come out on a Monday or Tuesday. If uh, you missed any of those links and you're like, hang on, it was DC underscore, it was DC what? All good. We've got all those important details for you in the description of this episode. So you can go in, give him and the boys from Hat Chat a follow and make sure you subscribe to this podcast. If you are an AFL fantasy player, the guys always have a whole ton of fun. They give you some great strategic perspectives and great different perspectives too on looking at the way you can play AFL fantasy. If you love these podcasts that you've got from us in the 50 most relevant so far, good news is you can always go back and re-listen to them as you hear players pop up during the preseason, you hear different different player notes from press conferences or you see something in the preseason matches, you go back and listen to these. They've been built in such a way that you can listen to them multiple times over as you understand the nuances of what is happening with a player. And we've also got these episodes up on YouTube. So if you'd rather watch them than just listen, simply search for the coaches panel, subscribe, turn the notifications on. So as soon as the episodes are live, you get send that DM notification straight to your device every single day in the preseason. We are releasing content to YouTube and throughout our podcasts and social media. All the links for that, as well as where you can join our Patreon supporter group, you can find alongside the stuff about Hat Chat in the description of this episode. All right. There's two players left to go in the 50 most relevant. Honestly, if I even give you one clue, it kind of makes it really obvious who it is. So the question is this, who do you think that I think is more relevant? Is it Nick Dacos or is it Brody Grundy? Simple question. Do you think it's the Ruckman that has been a beast for years and comes in an incredible value? Or is it arguably the best defender we've got that is reincarnate version of Gary Ablett Jr. and is entering into what many would say is a breakout season as he enters his third year. So who is it? Who do you think? Comment below. Send us a message. It's down to two. Grundy or Dacos? It's one of them tomorrow that's number two, and one of them will walk away as the number one in my 50 most relevant. Give it all. Now keep it true.